In December 1814, events on and off the battlefield will take the War of 1812 into an unprecedented direction. While representatives of the U.S. and Great Britain continue to negotiate a peace agreement in Ghent, Belgium, anti-war federalists from New England meet in Hartford, Connecticut, to discuss an alarming idea, secession from the United States. A country under attack by foreign invaders is now threatened by its own people. For the Madison administration, it is nothing short of a crisis. They knew that British agents were in Hartford talking to the New England politicians there and that there might be a secession movement. It looked like the whole thing might unravel. With political developments at a critical stage, the British target New Orleans, where a decisive victory could threaten the unity and independence of the United States. But standing in their way is Andrew Jackson, a 47-year-old Tennessean whose indomitable will, battle-hardened guts, and fiery temperament earns him the legendary nickname Old Hickory. Andrew Jackson is a pugnacious individual. He's fought duels, and when he takes command of the army, lodged between his lung and his heart, is a bullet. He's racked by dysentery, and yet that indomitable will pervades. And Jackson is a man to be reckoned with. Few cross Andrew Jackson, and those that do rarely walk away. As commander of the U.S. 7th Military District, Major General Jackson must oversee the defense of New Orleans. The pending fight will be more than just a military assignment. It's a chance to exorcise a deep hatred dating back to his youth when he was taken prisoner by the Redcoats during the Revolution. Some say it comes from the scar on his face inflicted by a British officer with his saber when Jackson refused to clean his boots, but it's deeper than that. Both his brothers and his mother have died of disease, the result of the brothers' captivity in Great Britain's hands. As Jackson's hate for the British grows, he begins looking for payback, and the War of 1812 offers the opportunity for that payback. Jackson expressed this feeling to his wife, Rachel, at the beginning of the war. I owe to Britain a debt of retaliatory vengeance. Should our forces meet, I trust I shall pay the debt. But Jackson's thirst for revenge was about to clash with an unexpected adversary, the President of the United States, James Madison. Think of these two men, Jackson and Madison. Physically, they're so different. Jackson's really tall and dynamic and vigorous military leader, and you've got Madison, who's brilliant, formally schooled, uh, very erudite. They couldn't be more different in the way they work with other people and just the way they look. Earlier that year, Madison had opposed Jackson's promotion to general, which was done without his consent. But despite Madison's personal dislike of the renegade, Jackson is the only man who can save New Orleans. Jackson arrives in the city on December 1st, 1814. He boldly promises to drive their enemies into the sea or perish in the effort. He acts immediately to organize the city's defenses. At once, all was bustle at New Orleans, wrote one resident. Jackson was untiringly active. Following his lead, New Orleanians of every ethnic background and social class unite to prepare for the defense of their city. Even men from as far away as Kentucky poured into the area, ready to fight. While New Orleans bustles before battle, Jackson recruits an army, illustrating the magnetic power of his charisma. Andrew Jackson is one of the most dynamic Americans in the entire history of the country. This is a man who by sheer force of personality can galvanize the ordinary man in the street to take up arms and have the vigor of a professional soldier. He literally got people off the street to help defend New Orleans and it was the sheer dynamism of his character. If ever a diverse force had been collected to defend the United States of America, it is at New Orleans. Regulars, frontiersmen, volunteers, French-speaking Creoles, Indians, pirates. A truly diverse and almost motley accumulation of men. You have America, so to speak, in all of its colors and languages. 
if you will, the common man? Would they have the discipline to stand and not retreat, not run, and obey the commands that were given? Jackson will soon find out the answer. His ragtag army of nearly 4,000 mostly untrained men doesn't appear to stand a chance against the 10,000 British troops headed their way. By December 1814, the British invasion force has a new commander of ground forces, Major General Sir Edward Pakenham. Sir Edward Michael Pakenham is one of the most popular officers in the British Army. He's won a great reputation wherever he served. So this is a man who the troops really look up to. On December 12th, fishermen sight the British Armada at the entrance to Lake Bourne. When the news reaches New Orleans, citizens panic, but Jackson doesn't. Instead, he puts the city in lockdown. Establishing some kind of order so that a resistance could be established uh, against an invader necessitated, in his mind, the declaration of, um, of martial law. Because he really thought that the, uh, the, the native population would, would, would cooperate with the British, would just say, take over the city, don't burn it, please. Don't do anything, you know, that would harm us. And, and Andrew Jackson was determined, I think, to burn the city himself if necessary. But he wanted those people to stand with him, behind him, to repel the British invasion. On December 14th, as the British advance towards New Orleans, they engage a small American gunboat flotilla on Lake Bourne. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Americans stand and fight until nearly every man is killed, wounded, or captured. The action slows, but does not deter the juggernaut. An advanced column sludges through swamps and bayous until it reaches the Villery Plantation, about eight miles from New Orleans. First, the British capture several members of the local militia. Then they decide to wait for the main body of the force to catch up. Instead of heeding the advice of their officers, to press on and take the defenseless city by surprise. It's a mistake they will soon regret. That's the turning point, I think. It, 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 the British had many more troops. They should have pressed on. They would have taken the city, I think. But they didn't. They thought that Jackson had in excess of 20,000. He had less than but the British command has no option. They are caught between the Mississippi River on one side and a swamp on the other. The only way now is to go straight ahead. So they have to hit the American lines, hit them hard, break the line and get through. And Jackson is determined to hold that line. And rather than wait for the British to attack, he attacks them first. By the eternal, they shall not sleep on our soil, Jackson declares when he learns the British are only a few miles away. He immediately orders a force of some 1,500 men to ambush the British camp. The 14-gun Carolina parallels the infantry as it sails down the fog-shrouded Mississippi towards the unsuspecting enemy camp. 